What's happening, everyone? My name is Akeem Henry. Welcome to the Mission of Medicine podcast. Right. Today we have Ready? another... Ex- Three, two, one, action. It was such a pivotal time in my life. Um, I was starting my first semester of grad school, and I was not able to get financial aid. Mm-hmm. So I was driving two and a half hours from Louisiana to Clinton, Mississippi, hmm. just to do my first semester of grad school. Because you couldn't live. Nearby. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't afford it. I right. needed the financial aid, but I wasn't able to get financial aid at the right. time. So the only thing that I could do was commute from my house sacrifice. in Louisiana. Super sacrifice. sacrifice. And I, I was listening to, um, it was like a Joel Osteen like, podcast. Okay. And I will never forget these words. He just kept saying whatever the, le- the sermon was about, it, he kept saying, how bad do you want it? Mm. And I was like, wow. I'm literally driving. I'm crying. I'm listening. I'm like, I'm going to class. Like, this is two and a half hour drive. Yeah. I can't believe I'm crazy enough to do this right now. And it stood out. You see the two channels lighting up. What's happening, everyone? My name is Akeem Henry. Welcome to the Mission and Medicine podcast. Today, we have another exciting interview for you all. Today, we have student Dr. Diamond Moses. Hey guys, what's going on? This the reason that we're doing these interviews um, is because we had a viral video that we did in our class a couple of weeks ago, and it went sensational. A lot of people chimed in, and they were really excited and inspired, and wanted to hear from people who took a non-traditional route to medical school. Yo, at what age did you start medical school? I started at the very young age of thirty-six years old. Twenty-two, twenty-three, thirty-one, twenty-four, twenty-two. So today we're going to take a deep dive into Diamond's story her journey into medicine, and what that was like to share with you all. You ready, Diamond? Yeah, let's go. All right, let's get it. So, Diamond, just give a brief background and introduction about yourself, where you're from, what school you attended, um, what was your major, and what age did you start medical school? Okay, well, my name is Diamond. I am from Covington, Louisiana. I attended undergrad at Southern University in Baton Rouge, go Jags. Um, And I went to Mississippi College and got my master's degree, and I graduated in 2021. Um, and I started medical school last year, 2023, and I am 30 years old. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, definitely. The first question, Diamond, did you have a career before medical school? If so, what was it? Several careers. <laughs> okay. Careers, okay. I've had, I've had several jobs before I, uh, got into medical school. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a teacher for two years. Mm-hmm. I taught 10th grade and I taught eighth grade. I uh-huh. taught math and science. Um, and I did clinical research for about a year and a half before my acceptance into medical school. Awesome. Great. And so what kind of motivated you to change from the career path that you were already on to medical school? Yeah. So I've actually always wanted to be a doctor, um, at least since like the age of four. Um, but you know, just with life and things not going as planned, like we want to, Mm -hmm. um, I definitely had to fill in some gaps and, you know, figure out my journey of how I was going to get here. Um, and just God just placed me in those rooms where I was a teacher um, and doing clinical research. Mm -hmm. Do you recall at a certain point in time where you actually said, oh, I wanted to become a doctor? Was it like a certain situation, experience that stood out to you and that made that? So for me, it's going to it would probably probably be like several different um, experiences, but I want to more so call them confirmational moment. Okay. Because I always knew that this is where I was going to be. Um, I never had a plan B. I always stuck with plan A because yeah. I knew I was always going to end up here. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously when it takes longer than what you expect, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you have those moments like, okay, am I really supposed to be doing this? Like mm-hmm. God sent me a sign. What am, am I on the right track? Am I doing the right things that I'm supposed to be doing? So I've had several moments where I knew that, you know, that's the direction I want to go in. So, for example, when I was doing clinical research, um, we did research in diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension in older black populations. Um, and the previous research coordinator before me, um, you know, she would kind of complain about, well, you know, you might not, not might get much reception from some of these people, you know, lower, not really understanding the um, socioeconomic status, you know, yeah. things of that nature. Mm-hmm. So when I took on that role, and the positive feedback that I got from the patients, the love and support when I told them I was applying to medical school, yeah. they wanted that for me so bad because they knew that they didn't have us there. And that was just really c- confirming for me that, 
okay, Diamond, these people are telling you, like, <laughs> we, we believe literally need you, you yeah. right? Like, we literally yeah. need you. You need to keep going, keep mm-hmm. going, doing what you're doing, and just being able to explain, like, just basic lifestyle changes. And one lady really got her A1C down just from, you know, eating vegetables, doing the right things, and just hearing it from somebody that actually cares about her. So that was just confirmation that I needed to know that, okay, you can't quit because people actually do right. need you in this space. And those are important because it helps solidify your resolve to become a physician because you have those people that's pouring into you right motivate right. when you have self-doubt or when you feel like there's something limiting you're limiting your steps to the next level you have people that's in your corner and they Absolutely. sometimes are strangers sometimes yeah the that's what got don't me. even know you it, right? that's what got me it was complete strangers mm-hmm. never met these people in my life and just doing health coaching with them and them hearing me speak about um you know just certain things when it comes down to even black people or just overall health and in general mm-hmm. It was just it was an amazing experience to just see changes and just changing lives just from being a research coordinator. So I was like, imagine what I could do if I was an actual, you know, doctor. So it just confirmed that, you know, I just had to keep going and I was on the right track. Gotcha. What was that process like for you to take the MCAT and also apply to medical school? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So what makes my story a little bit different from most is that. Um, I graduated undergrad in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. But for me, I came from a school that didn't really have a true pre-med program. Mm-hmm. I took the prereq, so I had passed everything. Um, but there was no guidance. Like, imagine just being advisors? fed to the wolves. Yeah. And like, oh, yeah, all you got to do is just, you know, you've taken all the prereqs. You know chemistry because my background's in chemistry. Yeah, okay. you're going to do fine. Just take the MCAT. So I'm, you know, going into it oh, that's all I got to do is just take the MCAT and I'm going to be fine. And then I get slapped in the face. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, it was really a long journey of discovery for me. Yeah. And um, I do think that having mentors and people that um, are going to actually guide and help you in mm-hmm. such a rigorous, you know, career that we're mm-hmm. trying to get into and I didn't have that. So mm-hmm. that was really my main reason for why it took so long. So okay. found out the hard way. So I was like, OK, let's go back. Studied a little bit more, did a little bit more, but it still wasn't enough. And people that know for the MCAT, actually gone the MCAT? Yeah, exactly. So people that know who've actually gone through this, you know, it it's not just let me read a few flashcards. It takes a lot of lot of work. What um, resources did you use? So when I really started studying, yeah. I actually knew what I was going to do. Um, I used Kaplan. I used um, UWorld for question banks. That was my absolute favorite, Mm -hmm. um, favorite that I think that's really what got me over was UWorld questions. Um, Just the breakdown was just perfect for me and how I like to learn. Yeah. Um, I actually didn't use Anki at all. Okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Anki warriors out there, no. Yeah, I actually did not use Anki (laughs) at all. Um, I like handwritten notes and I... You know, I like to really fully understand. I'm a conceptual learner, so understandable. Um, I like to write notes. I use a whiteboard. I still use it to this day for medical school. I love a whiteboard. Just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just making sure that I have those concepts down, mm-hmm. and at least that I can integrate th- integrate them into like harder, you know, questions or how they're mm-hmm. asked. So those are my main things. Did you take a post back? Did you do a post back? Um, I wouldn't call it post back, but it was it was grad school. Grad school. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. You want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to Mississippi College for grad school. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was another um, confirmational moment for me because that program was extremely rigorous. Okay. Um, And it pushed me to really, I guess, know that I was capable. Mm -hmm. Um, Undergrad is kind of a little bit different. Like, that's okay. You can easily get through, not easily, but you can get through um, undergraduate school. But that program um, where we're just thrown cadavers in, they point to the smallest nerve and you have to pick it out. Mm -hmm. Um, Sitting there and making myself and forcing myself to really learn and understand, I think that was very pivotal for me as well. Um, But it was a great experience. I love Mississippi College. I think that was really one of my defining moments of um, really getting my study habits together um, for med school and um, the MCAT. Yeah. Did you face any challenges at all with the admissions process to medical school? Um, any doubts in your mind or just like any hurdles that you had to jump through the process? Um, outside of the MCAT, of course. Outside of the MCAT? Uh, not really. I did apply twice. Um, the first time 
it was just my, I wasn't ready. Like my MCAT score wasn't where it needed to be. It was close, but it wasn't close enough. So Mm -hmm. it was like one last push that I needed to do for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But outside of that, I didn't really have any issues with my um, admissions process. But again, just going back to having those mentors and people that actually like know what they're doing because applying the first time versus the second time, you know, there are some things that I definitely tweaked to make sure that I, you know, had better and knew what I was doing. Um, Just wholeheartedly being prepared. Is yeah, it's really important it to have like people review your application and having those mentors yeah, exactly. to help guide you get yeah. the tidbits. Yeah. So that makes sense. So now that we're finally here we're in medical school, we just wrapped up y'all our Yay. first year of medical school. So we're officially M2s moving on. However, during this past year was a lot of learning and a lot of figuring things out. And, you know, in medical school, they're throwing a lot of information at you. And sometimes we have to go and look up information using third party resources. And there's so many third party resources out there. Yes. So, Diamond, do you have any favorites that you use that got, that got you by for the first year? Yes. My top three is um, USMLERX. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that resource that the school gave for us. Um, I like boot camp and AMBOSS. Those are my top three uh, resources that I utilize for this year perfect and how did you utilize those resources so like what was your process of study yeah yeah mm-hmm. so for me um typically i would go through what our professors wanted us to talk about or what what they were trying to teach for like the lecture mm-hmm. um and then i would go home and i would correlate what they taught um with the brick on usmle rx um so that's how i would take my initial notes um, I would go to boot camp like later on during the weekend to kind of like fill in some gaps that, you know, I might not be aware of um, and just watch those videos and make sure I correlate them back to my notes. It's pretty much I kind of add on to my notes every single time like I learn something new. Yeah. Um, and then it went, when it comes down to Amboss, I mainly use that for um, mainly diagnostic purposes and just knowing like how stuff will present if they present in different ways. Just that's mainly like the extra like the extra fluff that I needed. Okay. And I also kind of use that when I go into like PPM and have mm-hmm. to do like actual clinical stuff so that I'm actually like aware and, you know, mm-hmm. up to date. Got you. And, you know, in spite of all the hard work that we do, you know, study, que- practice questions, study and go into lecture, you know, medical school can consume us very much so that we don't have time to do other things. How are you able to make time for relationships outside of medicine? Do you think dating or being married in medical school is manageable? Yeah, um, it's definitely manageable. Anything is manageable, um, but it just takes two people to make any type of relationship work, whether it's romantic or platonic. Mm -hmm. I just think that both parties need to be, you know, invested in making it work. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say um, from the relationship and dating standpoint, I do believe that your partner needs to overstand. I just understand they need to, <laughs> to over, they need to overstand <laughs> what they are getting themselves into. Yeah. Um, this journey is just it's not it's not typical. It's not typical for, you know, your average person. Like what we're doing is not average at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a blessing to find or have a partner that understands the totality of what we are going to Mm -hmm. what we're about to do even going into residency it's a sacrifice on their end as well but i believe that obviously if like the relationship is worth it you know it's nothing to compromise and make sure that you know it works out so i think it's doable for sure for sure i think that was good advice for sure um in regards to what motivates you through medical school through those hard times through those difficult times what pushes you through oh lord my family for sure okay um They've always known I wanted to, you know, do this as well. Mm -hmm. And they they didn't have any doubts. They they always believe that, okay, she's going to be she said it since she was four. (laughs) She's more than likely going to do it. She's going to make sure that it happens. And they've just been in my corner every step of the way and had complete faith that I would do what I said I was going to do. And I'm here and I'm pretty much doing this for them. Awesome. Um, Did you have any doubts in your mind uh, to returning to student life? Um, after you know taking some time off and how did you overcome them a little bit not much um obviously like my initial thoughts were okay i'm 30 i'm about to be in class with a bunch of 24 23 22 year olds 
Like I haven't been in this environment in a really long time. Yeah. Even just sitting in class in general, I was like, oh God, I need to get to my house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, after that, I mean, I, I love our class for the most part. Mm-hmm. So it was a very easy adjustment. Um, mm-hmm. As long as I can like speak to everybody, have a conversation with anybody and, you know, get through the day with, you know, just talking and laughing and, you know, going about our day. It was mm-hmm. fine. I got over it quick, but I did have those initial thoughts. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. And I know, like, speaking about, you know, getting along with everyone and, like, the culture within mm-hmm. our school, I know it's a very family-oriented, yeah. you know, having that HBCU background. Um, I know you went to a HBCU prior to this, so you kind of have already, you know, a, a better insight into what it's like, because I didn't go to an HBCU, mm-hmm. I went to a PWI. So what is, um, I guess, compared to undergrad, how would you compare Meharry towards, like, a Ma- HBCU? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a similar feel, like you said, just like if it, every day feels like a family reunion, okay. there's something going on. Um, the culture in itself is just, I think every black person should experience it. Um, the love that you have while you're here um, is unmatched because obviously once we go out into the real world, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're going to be back to being the minority. Right. So I think like while we're here, while we're able to like love on each other and support each other, I just think that is extremely important. And I did get that at my last HBC because I love Southern real bad. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, since studying medical school, have you had any standout revelations or observations that just stood out to you? Since starting medical school? Mm-hmm. Something that you probably didn't think about and then you got here, you're like, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, I actually, I, I guess it's been really surprising to see myself really growing into the role that we're being trained for. So towards the end of like PPM, I started noticing wow, I'm actually gotten really good at this because I remember the first time when we went into PPM and I'm like, why, why are they throwing what, what is school? PPM? Yeah. What, yeah oh, okay. what, what is PPM? Um, principal practices of medicine. So that's how we go in and we start practicing and learning like how to introduce ourselves to a patient, what questions to ask, how to take a um, history, mm-hmm. um, what possible labs we need to order. You know, it's it's kind of like practicing just to um, before we start clinic. You're right. Um, but yeah, I've just started noticing toward the end. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm kind of starting to feel like I'm more really, confident, yeah, more yeah. confident and growing into that role. Mm-hmm. And uh, definitely by year four, we will be ready. But I definitely, I'm starting to feel it now a little bit more since we've been here for a year now. So that's been pretty um, exciting to kind of see come into fruition. Awesome. Awesome. And you know, in medical school, burnout is real. Mm-hmm. Burnout is real in any professional school, graduate school. Um, what activities do you participate in to kind of de-stress um i do go to the gym pretty consistently i have to you know make sure my health is a priority so Mm -hmm. i definitely take care of myself in that aspect um i listen to myself if i'm very overwhelmed whatever checklist that i have for the day it's just going to be pushed to the next day if i can't go on anymore Today I can give maybe twenty percent. That's what it's gonna give. <laughs> um, I I definitely try to honor how I'm feeling. Um, I'm realistic at the same time. If mm-hmm. I know I need to get a few more things done, I'll make sure I try to push as much as I can. But I just yeah. for the most part I hold myself to the highest regard. So mm-hmm. yeah, if I'm tired or if I'm feeling fatigued, burnt out. I'm getting in the bed. <laughs> I'm gonna watch a comfort show. I'm just gonna do something that's yes. gonna get me off of uh, cardiomyopathy for the moment. <laughs> like I, I have to. So I typically I, I go for runs and things of that nature. Okay. I definitely keep my health a priority, but I also just listen to myself. And mm-hmm. if it's time for me to stop, then I, I will stop. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes just taking a break helps optimize your focus and yeah, productivity yeah. for the next day. Like it allows you to recharge, refresh, and go at it at 100%. Right. So right. definitely important. This is a little bit more of a serious topic here. What is it like being a black woman in medicine? Ooh. I think it's an honor. Mm. Um, I think it's a privilege. I think that I love black women. So I just... I. I hold us to a high regard and a high standard as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously it is, there are some challenges um, with being a two-time minority with being a woman and in the field of medicine. It's definitely um, challenging, but I think like 
throughout our whole history of black women, we've women always we've been able to bear the hard stuff and deal with the hard stuff mm-hmm. and make it look flawless. And I love that about us. So black women in medicine is top tier. We're the upper echelon and I'm not afraid to say it. Um, but I, I yeah, I, I just, I love us. And I think that there's nothing that we can't do. So kudos and shout outs to anybody who's in the field of medicine and you are a black woman because you are a superhero. Do you have any advice particularly to like maybe a young black pre-med student that's watching this video right now who's saying, I want to be in her shoes one day. Yeah. Do you have any words for her? Yeah. Um, I would say find someone that looks like you, um, find a mentor, find somebody that's going to care about your success because it's also easy to find a mentor. Um, and sometimes people have to pay for those services, which is ridiculous to me It's in certain, you know, cases, mm-hmm. but not so much find somebody that just looks like you, but you need to find somebody that cares about you and cares about where you're going. Yeah. Um, because you will always need someone to pour into you and um, just, you just need the motivation. Even if you have like the, the smarts and, you know, you got the 4.0 GPA, you have all of that. It takes so much more than just being, you know, just smart. You're more than just being smart. Like you're powerful. You have so much to give to the world. So make sure you just find somebody um, that's going to, you know, look after you and just full fully like be your support system because you're going to definitely need it mm-hmm. and nothing's impossible. Awesome. Um, in the other aspect for just a non-traditional student who wants to pursue medicine, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, um, I think my main thing is if you really, really want something, you will do whatever it takes to get it. Um, For me, um, it was such a pivotal time in my life. Um, I was starting my first semester of grad school and I was not able to get financial aid. Mm -hmm. So I was driving two and a half hours from Louisiana to Clinton, Mississippi, just to do my first semester of grad school. Because you couldn't live. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't afford it. I needed the financial aid, but I wasn't able to get financial aid at the right. time. So the only thing that I could do was commute from my house sacrifice. in Louisiana. Super sacrifice. sacrifice. And I, I was listening to, um, it was like a Joel Osteen like, podcast. Okay. And I will never forget these words. He just kept saying whatever the, le- the sermon was about. It, he kept saying, how bad do you want it? Mm. I was like, wow. I'm literally driving. I'm crying. I'm listening. I'm like, I'm going to class. Like, this is two and a half hour drive. Yeah. I can't believe I'm crazy enough to do this right now. And it stood out. I don't even remember the sermon or whatever, but those words I will never forget. He just said, how bad do you want it? And it carried me throughout all of grad school. Mm-hmm. Um, so just for any non-traditional student, if you want it bad enough, you will literally do whatever it takes to make sure that, you know, you get to where you want to be. So just... Don't give up. I know life is hard. Like, even just with this story, like, that's insane. People mm-hmm. hear me talk about it and they're like, you did what? You you drove how how long to get to school? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, just just don't give up. And you have to find that perseverance deep within to mm-hmm. just go after it. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, do you plan on having children? Yeah, I do want some kids. Okay. Yeah, like, uh, if they If they were interested in medicine, would you support them or... Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm all here for, for supporting anybody's dream. So whatever they want to do, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm definitely a full champion for it. Okay. And if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give to your younger self? Ooh, guide yourself through the process. To guide myself through the process. Um, just to slow down. Mm. Just to take in everything that you're doing in the moment. Kind of be in the moment. Don't be such in a rush to okay, I need to do this by this or just be so strict and so hard on myself about just the timeline because that will eat away at you and it will make you feel worse than what you're actually doing because more than likely you're probably doing a lot Mm -hmm. and you're not giving yourself enough credit for what you're actually doing. So for me, it would just be to slow down, take a deep breath and acknowledge where you are and just kind of be grateful, um, grateful with your journey. Perfect, perfect. Do you have any last pieces of advice that you want to give someone out there that could be pre-med or in medical school? Yeah. um, My last advice would be just to trust your process um, and really find purpose in wherever you are at your at this very moment. 
Um, for me, being a teacher, those kids were bad. Let me just say that. I love them though. I had to pray um, in the mornings to be like, Lord, yeah. I know it's a reason why I'm here. Let it just be purposeful. Like, I don't want to just be idle and just doing it to pass time because I'm waiting to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. It was more so like, okay, God, I'm here. You have me here in this moment. Make it be impactful. Make it be purposeful. Like, if if I'm meant to just touch one kid and maybe the trajectory of their life changes because they had me as a teacher, mm -hmm. I've, I've done enough and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I would say that would be my last bit of advice just to like honor and, and acknowledge where you are in this season um, and just, you know, live in it. Make sure you're not just being idle because you're so anxious to get to the next place. Like, yeah. Be impactful in whatever you're doing at the moment because your time is going to come where you're going to get to these spaces. So mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be my advice. And then I have one last like pop culture type of question yep. about what's lately going on trending on social media and you, because you have a teacher background mm -hmm. i want to run this past you yeah there was a video of this young man who um basically he has like an elementary school school students and he had them do his nails and the hair and he was recording a video and then i think he got fired for the video what's your thoughts on the whole thing yeah um did you see the video i did see the video i saw it um there are times and places for everything. Mm -hmm. I think um, some things shouldn't be recorded. However, and I think that's also in like lieu of today's society, like we literally record and post yeah. every single thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what I will say, and it's kind of is in his defense, um, those kids, some of them go home to some not the best environment. Right. Sometimes this is their outlet. If they want to, like, love on their teacher, play with them, do whatever, it happens. Mm -hmm. I still have videos in my phone of, like, kids doing crazy stuff with me, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I don't totally, like, disagree because it happens. It happens to women, too. Yeah. Like, the girls braiding braid teachers' hairs all the time, mm -hmm. um, but... I don't know. It's kind of touchy. It's kind of yeah, iffy because it yeah. can't go both ways. Um, yeah. um, but I think that he has a really good uh, reputation with his kids, mm. which should be most important because right. we already got a teacher shortage. Yeah. 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 It's definitely one of those tricky situations. And when I heard the story, I was kind of torn both ways. Like, was it overstepping boundaries? But I also see him building a connection. He has a good rapport with the children, which matters most. Yeah. And it seems like they really respect him as well. Absolutely. I, should he be fired for it? I don't I don't necessarily think he should be fired personally. I thought like, you know, maybe just a warning and ex explanation about like, you know, the boundaries that we want to set here and like maybe guidelines for social media yeah. and postage usage. But I don't. I think I, I definitely agree with that. But the fire was too far because yeah. um, those kids at the end of the day, when they come to school and you're with them for like eight hours out of a day, mm -hmm. like they're going to become attached to you yeah. at some point. Yeah, definitely feel the void right there. But Diamond, I appreciate you so much, student Dr. Thank Diamond you. Moses. She came on today, y'all. I hope you all are inspired, got something from her story, a major takeaway. Um, I really appreciate you coming on here today. Nope. Where can the people um, find you? Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Diamond Lene. Perfect. I'm going to link it down below. Thank you so much again. All right. Thank you. Remember, y'all, it's not a marathon nor a sprint. It's a mission to medicine. Peace out.